now, regulations aren't really being made in the interest of people anyway. The people who write the regulations are the very largest players in the industry. So when a, a simple non-tech example would be, uh, there was a big uh, uh, lead paint scare in the toy industry a bunch of years ago. A bunch of Dora toys or something had red paint in it. They were all outsourced from China. They came in, they had red paint. So what do we do? Well, we're going to form a commission, get the leaders of industry together, the leaders of government, and come up with regulations to prevent this from happening again. And the regulations they came up with was a testing process that required $40,000 per toy that you're going to release on the market. What are small toy manufacturers supposed to do with that? If you make handcrafted toy trains that you want to sell to a toy store, how do you, how do you participate in that? Well, you can't. So industry used their own mistake, their own problem of big industry as an excuse to regulate the marketplace so that it would advantage them even more. Right? So regulation right now favors the favors the largest players on the block. Right? The reason why Uber can move into New York is because they have a war chest. The investment in Uber is not paying for the app. The investment in Uber is paying to deregulate the marketplace in their favor. So that's one. The other biggie, and it's a simple tax shift, is, I mean, the, the simple way to say it is, right now, in the, the way our, I sound like Bernie here, our tax code, the simple problem with our tax code is that capital gains are taxed much, much less than real earnings, than dividends. Right? So what is that? If you're thinking of it as a computer program and now you're biasing it so that people who make money by simply having money don't have to pay taxes, but people who make money by earning money have to pay taxes. What are you building into that system? Right? If you want to optimize your economy for the accumulation of capital, for the extraction of poker chips from the playing board into the accounts of shareholders, then optimize it that way. If you want to optimize the economy for the circulation of capital through the, through the society so that people can create and exchange value between each other, then you want to reverse that bias. You want to, you want taxes on dividends and earnings to be really low, and taxes on capital accumulation to be high. So, how do we make that happen? Like, how do we actually get people to change? And what can, and what can people who are here do in day-to-day -day choices, or um, in choices of, with their startups that they're working on? Well, I mean, the easy way to disempower the sitting bags of capital that are there is to try, in some ways, try to ignore them, which is hard to do. You create an application with two friends, and you can build it pretty much on a laptop, and then use a scalable server, even go to Amazon Cloud, I don't care, if you can go to something scalable. You don't need 10 millions of dollars from Y Combinator to get to the next level. Once you bring those people in, now you're in a different game. Now you're no longer building a business for the prosperity of that business. Now you're building a business in order to sell it. And so if your goal is to create a thriving, sustainable business, then think twice about selling it. Right? Don't sell it. You know, hold on to it. So that's sort of number one. Uh, as individuals, it's really, I mean, as consumers, you can make way better choices about how you buy things. You know, it's as simple as if someone buys my book from a local bookseller instead of from Amazon. I mean, their local bookseller, now there is money that is circulating in their community. That's a dollar more. It's a dollar more for that book, but you're going to see that dollar circulate through your community five times. So you're going to get that dollar five more times than you would if you spent it on Amazon and it goes up into a share price. Or you're spending it at a company that's taking a loss on the book in order to create a platform monopoly in publishing so they can hop over into what's called another vertical and take that over. Right? They don't care about the books. They care about the monopoly. So it's a very different, a very different thing. You can, if you're organizing a company, consider how can your company make everyone who touches your company wealthy. Right? The traditional corporate industrial tactic is to look at everybody else as a resource to extract value from them. 
but if you're extracting value from your customer base, eventually they get too poor to be your customer. That's the problem that Walmart is having now. The towns that Walmart has gone into are going bankrupt. They're losing their customers, so now Walmart's closing stores, and the towns are having to figure out, hey, how do we rebuild a local infrastructure? How do we rebuild, how do we create a, a drugstore and, a, and, a, and a, a bookstore and everything else that we need to replace this big vacuum that came to our community and wiped out our, uh, uh, our connected tissue? Uh, companies can start thinking about communicating with their shareholders differently. So instead of being beholden to the growth of the share price, start telling your shareholders they're going to get dividends. They're going to earn real money for, what, for, for owning a, a portion of your company. Create companies as platform cooperatives, where your workers are owners in the company. There's a competitor to Uber who's just going to be opening in New York called Juno in a few weeks. And it's the same basic idea as Uber, except they pay the cabbies more, and the drivers own 50% of the company. Now, what does it mean when the drivers own 50% of the company? It means that when that company eventually pivots, as they all will, to mechanical cars driven by computers, you haven't done the research and development for the thing that will replace you. You've done the research and development for the company that you own. Right, so now the drivers are going out doing your work. Your job has been replaced, but your income hasn't been taken away because you own the thing. So these are, these are really, they sound complicated, but they're really simple things to do. They're just the basic steps. You have to think of things during a digital age. You have to think of the, the, the mechanisms that you're, that you're using and that the instruments that you're putting into place, you have to think of them like programs that are going to keep going, that are going to have uh, operating principles and bias them towards circulation, bias them towards making people wealthy. I promise you, if you have a business that's making its customers wealthy, that's making its suppliers wealthy, that's making its competitors wealthy, they're going to keep you around. But it's just not the way we think. Oh, make other people wealthy? Yes, make them wealthy so they can buy stuff from you. you know, and it's not, uh, it's not rocket science to do that. And to that point, that's, that's another policy suggestion, right? Building in mechanisms for other types of businesses, because cooperative businesses of that model that you're describing aren't actually possible in a lot of um, in a lot of places. So that's another. Right. I mean, luckily, there's things like B Corps and multi-purpose corps. There's a lot of alternative corporate structures that you can adopt now that let you value things other than your fiduciary responsibility to your shareholders. You know, it's it's. From an economics perspective, it's understanding that when you take in capital and you let a venture capitalist be in charge of your company, then the only contribution he's going to value is capital. But if you understand economics, you understand there's three main factors of production. Capital is one of them, but land and labor are the other two. This is back to Adam Smith that any any economist, any libertarian will tell you, land, labor, and capital. So how do we value the land and labor again? Right? That's by building it into the core of the company to understand that there are three kinds of contributions, and all three have to be rewarded by the company. You can't just look at a company as venture capital that's extracting value from land and labor, or you end up with a world that's going to die and the people with no jobs. So it's, I don't, it's interesting. Like you mentioned Y Combinator earlier, and I, you know, a lot of people, a portion of why the people are going to them are for the VC funding, but it's also for the mentorship models. Because there's a question I would have of, does everybody know how to do this, right? And I, I think the answer is probably that they don't. But so if they're not, if some of what needs to change is actually the advice they're getting, like how do we build a better um, support system for changing the thinking around how business happens? Like are there evangelists that exist that we can start to tell their stories more? Does it need to be a special, different type of incubator that actually focuses on this type of model? Like, how can we change the, the community around? I mean, let's do it. Um, you know, it's part of what Civic calls for. It's part of what, why we're here. It's part of why I wrote this book to say, here's a manual to begin. So understand what went wrong and understand how to, how to do it right. I mean, there's people around. Talk to Trevor Schultz at the New School, who's starting a whole organization on, is he here? Oh, yeah. Um, for a platform, <laughs> platform cooperatives with Nathan and Schneider. Talk to uh, Michelle Bowens at the Peer to Peer Foundation. Go to p2pfoundation.net and you'll see tons of articles. Talk to um, Robinhood in Finland. Talk to Inspiral in New Zealand. 
I mean, there are a lot of groups out there. A lot of them are looking at, at uh, blockchain. Even. A lot of those folks are sort of looking at how can we do authentication in a peer-to-peer -peer way. I mean, they get those those efforts get sidetracked really fast because people invest in them and they go, oh, bitcoins, bitcoins, and they money. You know, the people once you see the Winklevoss brothers anywhere, you know, stay away. Um, they did a bunch of uh, investing in Bitcoin, but you know, there are um, there are mentors out there, but. Honestly, I feel like um, a lot of people know in their gut what they're doing right. It's not rocket science. The, the young people that when they're in their dorm room in Stanford or Columbia and they come up with that idea, I feel like so many of them would be better off with $50,000 and no mentorship than $5 million in the mentorship they're getting. And the mentorship they're getting, they're not dumb. They're smart people, the VC guys. They're smart but they're smart at doing a very particular thing, which is bringing something to exit, right? Bringing something to a to a, an exit event. And I mean, gosh, I've got friends in here. Maybe David Benham is in here right now with with a with a product called Ready, you know, which has just gotten away from venture capital. And now he's like, oh, we can just do this thing. You know, it's used to be called bootstrapping, but. Or, or these days they call it bootstrapping, but it used to just be called building a business. You build a business, you get some revenue, you use some of that revenue to live and some of that revenue to invest back in the company. It's a slower growth thing, but when you grow slower, so much easier to develop a product that your customers like. Because then you can see your customer reaction. You can use good old fashioned quarters and semi-annual feedback and adjust and change. You're not stuck on the clock of 18 months. I've got 18 months to turn this thing around. That's not fair to any business that's in the real world. Some of it probably is that people don't see these things, right? I mean, I think of the, of the initiatives that you just mentioned, how many people in the room know of one of them? I've heard of one of them. Okay, that's about 10 hands. Well, you've heard of a lot. Of them. You've heard of Lumio as a great uh, decision-making tool that came out of General Assembly. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of them you won't hear of, right? Just like a lot of the best candidates for president you probably never heard of. You know, we heard of Trump. You know, so it's like just just because you don't know them doesn't mean they're not great. And the fact is, a lot of them are local. There is nothing wrong with creating a business that doesn't scale up. Not everything scales up. Scaling up is an artifact of the industrial age where you've got to become the one, the winner, the king of the hill. You can actually be one of many in your business. That's actually cool. There used to be these guilds. There were many people who built bridges and made houses and made shoes and they had guilds and they shared technologies and, and innovations with each other. And they understood that if everyone gets better, we're all doing better. They built a culture around what they did. You know, now it's as if you know, the economic term is the Gini number. The Gini, it's as if uh, uh, the Gini number is, is the number that if it's at zero, it means that everything's distributed everywhere. And if it goes to one, it means all the money has been scooped up by one player. It feels like the digital economy is structured so that there's going to be one big winner. It's like at the poker game at the end of the night when the one guy gets all the chips. Like, will it be Jeff Bezos? Will it be Mark Zuckerberg? Will it be uh, Sergey? You know, who's going to get everything? And that's because they're so addicted to scale. And even in our, in our good lefty progressive world, it's like I have so many kids come up to me and they want to create, I want to create a platform that can aggregate all of the websites that are aggregating the people who are doing social change. <laughs> and everybody wants to do that because everybody wants to have the thing that frames the thing that frames the thing. And I, I get that that's that sort of industrial age thinking and it's not as much fun as just doing the thing locally. It's so hard in a world where we all want 20,000 Twitter followers and we all want the recognition, but the satisfaction you get in creating a Greenlight bookstore in, in Greenpoint and having a community of people who love what you do, that you're supporting, becoming a human-scaled economies are local. They just are. And when they're local, they necessarily respect land. When they're local, they necessarily respect labor because those are the people who are paying the taxes to put your kids to school. So you need everybody to be participating. It's so much more enjoyable. So sure, you can come up with some mechanisms that people can model in lots of different places. But uh, in terms of having a, a satisfying business, you know, this is part of what we're retrieving in the digital age. It's a very almost medieval approach to business, you know, where it's part of my city, it's part of the place I live, and I do something, you know. 
we make fun of people making artisanal beers and you know, uh, you know, heritage yams or whatever. <laughs> I mean, what do the wealthiest people do when they retire? They go and make beer and yams and orchids and stuff. That's actually fun to do. And if you can do it in a way that supports your community and they're doing something that supports you, you start to see not all of it, but a larger percentage of your economic activity ends up taking place in a sphere between people on a, on a more local scale. And yeah, you're going to still buy your iPhones from you know, Apple and multinational conglomerates, but it doesn't have to be the entire economy.